Today, Mount St. Helens is mostly known for the eruption that occurred on March 27th of 1980. Often cited as the most disastrous volcanic eruption in U.S. history, a rising column of ash shot over 15 miles into the air and spread out over more than 10 different states while causing the deaths of approximately 57 people. With such a massive event, it's not surprising that its history prior to 1980 is less well known. Joe Carter was 32 years old and had a passion for skiing. For him, it went beyond just being a hobby. He was a member of the National Ski Patrol and worked at the Milwaukee Ski Bowl on weekends, which was a major ski area during its era from 1937 to 1950. Being a member of the National Ski Patrol, this means he had undergone serious training and testing in both skiing proficiency and first aid. It's safe to say that Joe Carter was very experienced and he knew the risks associated with mountains and skiing. On May 21st, Joe was climbing Mount St. Helens with a group of friends. They had brought along their skis and their intention was to climb partway up the mountain and then ski down. Joe brought along his camera to take pictures and it should have been a relatively simple and benign trip. Once the group reached the point from which they intended to ski down, Joe said that he would ski down first and take pictures of the others as they made their way past him. He then separated from his group and skied out of view. He set up his camera off to the side as he readied himself to take pictures of his friends. It was right around this point that something happened to Joe and he disappeared. Joe's party had no idea that anything had gone wrong and they made their way down the mountain and came upon the spot where they expected to see Joe, he was not there. Believing that perhaps Joe had just continued on to the bottom of the mountain, the rest of the group did the same. When they finally reached the base, Joe was not there, and he never arrived. It was at this point that they decided to call for search and rescue. The Seattle Mountain Search and Rescue Team consisted of Dr. Bob Lee, Dr. Otto Trott and Lee Stark was the first on scene and they made their way up to Joe's last known location. They came to a spot where he was supposed to have been set up to take pictures. Here they found a discarded film box on the ground. Next to it they found a single set of ski tracks indicating that Joe apparently raced down the mountain in a hurry. The Longview Washington Times printed this now infamous piece of text regarding the incident. Carter evidently took off down the mountain in a wild death-defying dash, taking chances that no skier of his caliber would take, unless something was terribly wrong or he was being pursued, says Lee, who was the first searcher to reach Carter's ski tracks. He jumped over two or three large crevices and evidently was going like the devil. When Carter's tracks reached the precipitous sides of Ape Canyon, the searchers were amazed to see that Carter had been in such a hurry that he went right down the steep canyon walls, but they did not find him at the bottom of the canyon as they expected. We combed the canyon one end to the other for five days. Sometimes there were as many as 75 persons in the search party, but no sign of Carter or his equipment was found, Lee says. End quote. The article certainly implies that searchers on scene believed that Carter was chased off the mountain by something, and was in such a hurry he didn't mind skiing off steep cliff sides. To think they combed the canyon floor for days without finding any sign of him is also quite incredible. The searchers made no mention of any tracks in the snow other than Carter's. So what scared him so deeply that he skied like his life depended on it? I've read hypotheses that perhaps whatever Carter was running from was in the sky, since the ground lacked any tracks other than his own. That does seem reasonable, but if it were accurate, you would think that the roughly 20 other skiers that were with him in his party would have also seen something in the sky had it actually been there. 
The same article from the Longview Washington Times has some quotes from the searcher Bob Lee that may shed some more light on the situation. Dr. Otto Trott, Lee Stark, and I finally came to the conclusion that the Mountain Devils got him, said Lee seriously. Lee, a member of the Seattle Mountain Search and Rescue Unit at the time, describes the hunt for Carter in Ape Canyon as the most eerie experience I have ever had. He said that every time he got cut off from the rest of the searchers during the long hunt, he got the feeling that somebody was watching me. I could feel the hair on my neck standing up. It was eerie. I was unarmed except for my ice axe, and believe me, I never let go of that. End quote. These are bizarre statements for someone in a search and rescue team to make. Dr. Lee was undoubtedly referring to ape-like creatures reportedly seen on Mount St. Helens, as well as an infamous incident that occurred in 1924, but more on that later. Rescue teams searched for Joe Carter for over 10 days and found nothing. Admittedly, when researching the story, I came across discrepancies in the reporting of it. One article in the San Bernardino Sun, written three days after Carter went missing, said that searchers found tracks in the snow, indicating that perhaps Carter had taken his skis off, but that they led into the wilderness before dissipating. This version doesn't necessarily make the story any less strange, however. Joe Carter was a diabetic, and he only had enough insulin on him for one day. Presumably, if he were on foot, he wouldn't have gone far. Unfortunately, he has not been found to this day, and no sign or evidence of his whereabouts were discovered once he reached Ape Canyon. Once again, we have a situation where a highly experienced individual, who most would not expect to have a problem, much less disappear on a mountain, has seemingly vanished. The inability to find his body and the strange evidence he left behind by racing down the mountain has led to speculation that he was chased by the mountain devils that are rumored to inhabit Mount St. Helens. The incident that started it all, as well as gave Ape Canyon its name, began in 1924. A group of five men came to the canyon a few years prior in search of gold. They established a small cabin in the area where they stayed throughout the duration of their work. The first sign of strangeness was when the men discovered footprints on the ground. They were large and oddly similar to a human's foot. On other occasions they would hear loud thumping sounds coming from the canyon walls. Later on, two of the men would witness what they described as a seven-foot-tall ape man among a group of pine trees. They would try firing at it, but miss as the creature disappeared into the thick forest. After the bizarre nature of this incident, the men would all agree to leave come the next morning. However, the show of aggression towards whatever these men saw apparently provoked an equally aggressive response from the ape creatures. Sometime late that night, the group started to hear thumping sounds as rocks pelted the roof of their cabin. A group of the ape creatures were attacking and damaging the cabin. The men fired back at the creatures through the walls and were able to hold out until the attack subsided as morning neared. The men packed up and left immediately likely ready to be done with the area and the ape men who lived there. As they left, however, the group came upon one of the creatures standing near the edge of what would later come to be known as Ape Canyon. It didn't move as one of the miners, a man named Fred Beck, raised his rifle and fired at the beast who tumbled off the ledge and into the canyon below. The men quickly continued out of the area, leaving behind a great deal of equipment and supplies. Once the men made it back to civilization, it wasn't long until some in the group started talking, and word of the incident spread and made it into newspapers at the time, many of whom printed fabricated details about the ordeal. 
Either way, the incident made its way deep into Mount St. Helens lore, where it remains to this day. Only one of the men, Fred Beck, would end up publishing an actual retelling of the events that supposedly transpired at Ape Canyon in a book called I Fought the Ape Men of Mount St. Helens, a book which, based on some of Beck's claims, likely created more skeptics than believers in the story. Since this time, there have been some half-hearted explanations of the events that occurred at Ape Canyon. Namely, that local Boy Scouts from a camp at the nearby Spirit Lake were the cause of the whole situation, as they would sneak out and throw rocks down the canyon and presumably at the cabin. This, however, is a weak explanation for all the purported events that took place. The difference between an over seven foot tall ape man throwing rocks and a Boy Scout is likely readily apparent. Not to mention the distance that would need to be traveled for these Boy Scouts to get to Ape Canyon on any given night. No, the incident at Ape Canyon doesn't require any explanation. It is an anecdotal story from a group of men who offer little in the way of evidence. But that doesn't mean they're lying. The incident at Ape Canyon is one you can choose to believe, or not. Or, if you're like me, you make a note of it and file it away in your mental library. Maybe it'll be of use someday. Since the events of 1924, there have been more than a few sightings of the ape men of Mount St. Helens. So maybe there is something to it after all. The Park Service at one point also confirmed the existence of the cabin where it all took place. But what does it have to do with the disappearance of Joe Carter? Well... At least one searcher felt that there was something odd about what happened, and felt brave enough to openly admit to what he called mountain devils to a newspaper in 1950. Setting the ape men story aside, Joe Carter's disappearance shares many commonalities with others of its kind. The incident occurred once he separated himself from his group followed by uncharacteristic behavior and eventually his disappearance leaving nothing behind but his discarded film box. No skis, no equipment, nothing. And if he indeed fell into the canyon, the over 75 searchers combing the area should have found something. And after all these years, no remains have turned up. Ultimately, it's impossible to know what really happened. We are left with a mystery that seems unsolvable. Maybe it makes sense to turn to local lore and legend when trying to find an explanation for the unexplained. Until next time, thanks for watching.